Our whole way of living has become geared to the automobile. I am your permit, your license, your permission to drive. I am a privilege and an obligation. Your obligation to drive skillfully, carefully, and legally. This year, there will again be thousands of innocent victims of those who will not recognize this obligation. I will be among the last papers of tens of thousands who will have no further use for me. And I may be merely a means of identification of almost a million whose injuries may be permanent. A million accident victims whose numbers contain twice as many 15 to 24 year old drivers as any other. In the United States in 1961, the population was 183,691,481. Of those 183 million lives, 36,285 were taken by motor vehicle fatalities, a number that was down 114 from the previous year and a number that would be the lowest number of motor vehicle fatalities in a given year until 2009 when the amount of deaths from motor vehicle accidents was 33,883. Now, statistically speaking, since they started recording the amount of motor vehicle fatalities, the age group of 16 to 20 year olds has the highest fatality rate. And it was Wayne Cochran in 1961 that would tell the tale of a guy and Gale out on a date that would change their lives forever. In a song that was never an out and out hit for him, but was a hit for many others, Last Kiss. She's going to heaven, so I got to be good, so I can see my baby when I leave. Hello to all of you out there getting ready for a date in your daddy's car, and welcome back to Heard It in a Love Song, the show where we safely take a trip to the past to discover the history of a song we all know and love. My name is Richard Hunt, and this week, as we enter the third week of... Splat Plus September! We are taking a look into the history of a song that never did much for the man who wrote it, but proved to be a massive hit for three other bands, Last Kiss, by Wayne Cochran. It's a pleasure to welcome the legendary Wayne Cochran. We start our story in Thomaston, Georgia, on May 10th, 1939. This is where and when we meet up with Talvin Alexander and Millie Lee Cochran in their small home in Thomaston, where they just welcome to the world Talvin Wayne Cochran. The Cochrans came from the wrong side of the tracks with Wayne saying, we were the down people from the south of town. We never got no respect. But Wayne was intent on gaining notoriety, even as a kid. He recalled writing his name on a class paper, and as he looked around at all his fellow students, thinking that they'd all live and die unknown, he knew he'd get his name in the history books one way or another. Childhood pals named Wayne the Dreamer. Growing up, Wayne was a bit of a rebel. As a teen, he'd seen the original Last of the Mohicans from 1920, and the Mohawks on the Native Americans made an impression on him. I thought that was so incredible. It reminded me of the Roman gladiators, so I grew me a mohawk. And although he was pretty sufficient at playing basketball, his coach wasn't crazy for the look. I was a pretty good basketball player, and the coach said I couldn't go on the court with a mohawk, and I didn't want to cut it off. We were playing for the championship, and we were pretty good. So what I did was I went and got all the team to get mohawk. So if he didn't let all of us play, none of us could play. How about that? In the ninth grade, when the principal demanded that he cut his non-mohawk hair, Wayne just quit. And legend has it that the same principal wanted Wayne's band to play the prom for 50 bucks, Wayne demanded $700 and got it. A great love of music found Wayne Cochran very early in his life. As a kid, he'd been exposed to country, pop, and big band, but what really shook his world up was hearing Elvis crooning out, Baby, Let's Play House. Come back, baby, I wanna play house. On the jukebox at a local honky-tonk. He was my idol, said Cochran. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! And while Elvis was a big influence on him early on, it was a well-known DJ operating out of Nashville that would blow Wayne's world wide open. It would be John Richburg's influential radio show on WLAC that would introduce Wayne to R&B, rock, and soul music specifically done by black artists, with John, going by John R., featuring performers like Chuck Berry and Fats Domino on his program. <laughs> I would go out and sit in my daddy's car starting about 11 o'clock at night and listen to John R. on the radio. All right, let's go with Sir Latimer Brown. He got one that's breaking out crazy like, you know, it's a great record, I think. Uh, one called It's a Sad, Sad World, and you know it is. Latimer, tell us about it. <laughs> 
His broadcast went all through the South, and I remember the first time I got to fly up there and meet him, I couldn't believe he was a white guy. He sounded like a black guy, which is a statement that would be echoed by people later on about Wayne himself. A simple car radio helped Wayne discover the music he loved the best. Rock and roll was just happy music, boogie music, simple music. Then there was blues, and if you took blues and put it into a rock and roll beat, that's called rhythm and blues. R&B was more intense. The singing's more intense. The music's more intense. It was just a much more intense music than plain old rock and roll, he would say to author Jimmy McDonough. With his new love of R&B, Wayne was thirsty to create his own take on it. By working in the cafeteria kitchen at school, Wayne would make a dollar a week, and he would take that dollar and turn around and spend it on piano lessons. And in a one man's trash is another man's treasure situation, Talvin saved a guitar from his brother's trash can and gave it to Wayne. My daddy got me an old guitar and put some strings on it. He supposedly played guitar and sang a little bit, but after I was born, he never did it, so I never got to hear him play a lick. My grandparents and my parents, everybody really, liked music. So we would just sit around the house every Sunday, play guitar, and sing. It wasn't long before Wayne linked up with music manager Bobby Smith, who had worked with many artists including Otis Redding, James Brown, Bobby Lee, and racist, pedophile, cousin fucker, Jerry Lee Lewis. You broke my wheel, the blood of three. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Wayne Cochran, under the Atlanta-based label Scotty Records, would cut his first two songs in 1959 at an Athens, Georgia TV station, WGTA, located in the University of Georgia. The songs were The Coup, And then you could kill me, baby. Oh, come on now. And the B-side, My Little Girl. Well, my little girl, she no Fun fact here is that the keyboardist on the coup was a young Ray Stevens, who would later go on to have a string of novelty hits, including The Streak. But the Athens area wasn't really the place to be for young up-and-coming musicians. That would be about two hours south in Macon, Georgia, so that is where Wayne made himself a home next. Macon would be the jumping point for not only him, but Little Richard, James Brown, and Otis Redding. And even though Wayne recalled that there were really no nightclubs that featured any real entertainment, only showcasing slow dance bands, somehow all four of those very eccentric performers made it big. Wayne Cochran was very unafraid to be exactly who he was in the 1960s. And that was an outlier. A southern white man in the 1960s who loved R&B and had not one racist bone in his body, him even being quoted with saying, they call me white soul, blue eyed soul. But that's a lot of horse shit. Soul ain't got no color. Soul is just being honest. Wayne lost a lot of friends that called him some very vulgar racist nicknames. I was even routinely threatened by the local Ku Klux Klan. One night, while visiting his friends in the band Johnny Jenkins and the Pine Toppers at the Club 15 in Gray, Georgia, Wayne heard their cover of a hot song at the time, Peggy Lee's Take on Fever. When you put your arms around me, I get a fever that's so hard. And that ignited a fever in him to finally give in and start working on an R&B career. It was also around this time that Wayne became friends with Otis Redding. I had a yellow Buick convertible with a black interior, and he'd come by and just borrow that car and keep it for two or three days. He'd just keep my car. I truly would have loved to see Otis and Wayne at this moment in time breaking color barriers while towering over the people in Macon as Otis was six foot one and Wayne was six foot two. Part of me wonders if they weren't the inspiration for Harold and George from Captain Underpants. But I digress. The pair would go to the local Dairy Queen for ice cream, and Wayne would buy a cone. But when Otis was up next, he was instructed to go around back. But Wayne insisted that they sell the cone to him, so he could just hand it to Otis without any racist humiliation. I was so ready to burn that place down, Wayne told author Scott Freeman. A white guy could sit beside you. He'd been drunk for three days and smelled like a brewery, and it was all right because he was white. I'd sit there and think, something is bad wrong here. Wayne Cochran would play bass on Redding's first single, Shout Bama Lama. And the pair even shared a stage, the wedding together on Shout, during a frenzied battle of the bands in East Macon. Cochran was later amazed to find out that he had in turn influenced Redding. Otis had his big horn band, and I had one doing R&B here in Florida. Otis would fly down every now and then, and then he liked the way our band was choreographed. I did all the choreographing for the horn lines, so he'd come down, watch it, go back, and teach his band what we were doing. Once he'd come down here, I went to see him, we sat and talked, and he just said, I hope you won't be upset by this. But I just had an interview with Life Magazine, and I told them you were my hero, and that you were my model for music. It just sort of took me aback, because the whole time I thought I was copying him. Cochran would remain close to Otis until the end of his life. Redding had been planning to visit Wayne when he died in a plane crash, with Cochran recalling hearing the news. 
I got in the car that night to go to the bar to do my show, and as I pull out of the driveway, the announcer says, Otis Redding was killed this afternoon. I thought he was joking. I said, I can't believe he would do a stupid thing like that. That ain't funny. Two or three minutes later, he said, This afternoon, Otis Redding was killed in a plane crash. My whole world fell apart. That was my closest friend. I had to pull over and just sit there. I couldn't drive. That was a horrible night. I went over to the bar and we canceled all the shows. Much like fellow making Georgia Wildman James Brown, Wayne's live shows were so energetic that he left very little energy for the crowds to go home with. He was so close to James Brown that it wasn't real, Bobby Smith would say to Scott Freeman. He would do virtually anything to get an audience's attention. And while local audiences ate him up, his album sales weren't so devoured. But undeterred, Cochran continued to put out rock and roll singles on minor labels the most significant of which being Last Kiss, a song he wrote and recorded in 1961 for Gala Records. But we will get there. Now, after the success, and somehow lack thereof, that Last Kiss brought for Wayne Cochran, he, in homage to his pals James Brown and Otis Redding, will continuously fold in more and more horns. James and Otis are the ones that got me into horns. Out of sight. You got your highest eagles on. And Mr. Pitiful, the first song that Otis recorded that had horns in it. The horn line was... That got me wanting horns. Around this same time, a club owner in Shreveport suggested to Cochran that he expand his band. I had a four-piece rhythm section plus myself. He really liked us and he wanted me to add horns to the band. He told me about a group down in Baton Rouge that had horns called the Dixie Crystals. So I drove down there, and believe it or not, I hired about three or four people out of the band that day. And that was the beginning of our horn section. Back then, the only horns you'd have is maybe a four-piece rhythm section with a saxophone. So I kept adding horns. Three saxes, I added a trumpet, then I added two trumpets. So I had a sax section, a trumpet section, I added another trumpet, so I had three and three. And then I added a trombone for a bottom for the trumpets. Then I added another trombone. So I ended up with a sax section, a trumpet section, and a trombone section. I had a kid with me named Tony Klotka that I hired right out of Berkeley, and he started writing arrangements. Now I love melodies, so if he wrote a real jazzed up thing, I wouldn't like it. I said, no, you gotta stay with the melody. I'm an old hillbilly. If it ain't got no melody line, and ain't got no song. His band, which would shortly be dubbed the CC Riders, would explode around the area. I'd go in and do a gig, and I was new, so I'd do a great job. And there'd be eight or ten club owners who stayed in touch with each other. Hey, what acts you got? Are they any good? Can I get them? So they got to calling about me. What about this guy? Should I bring him in? And the guy would always say, yeah. So I'd work that whole circuit, five or six clubs. And then someone from another area would call, and there'd be another circuit. And so I got to where I was working circuits, like the old circuit preachers in the old days, who would do circuits of churches in different areas of the nation. And that's where I got the name from, Cochran Circuit Riders. It all just unfolded, man, you know? I didn't plan my career, I just loved what I was doing, and it worked. Now up until this point, Wayne Cochran was not yet known for his hair. True, it was quite an impressive pompadour, one he grew to pay homage to James Brown, but it was the 1960s. It's not exactly like he was breaking the pomade mold. But a chance encounter with two albino brothers, who at the time were playing in an R&B band called It and Them, would inspire Wayne to make a decision that would only add to his notoriety. Now these albino brothers were Johnny and Edgar Winter, and being albino meant their hair was as white as white could be. And when Wayne saw them play, he saw not only how talented they were, but he saw the way the lighting changed the color of their hair, changing it from hue to hue as the lights themselves did. They were great musicians great musicians, and the two lead guys were albinos, and they had the foot switches controlling red, green, and blue lights, and every time they changed the lights, their hair would change colors, and I'm thinking, man, that is incredible. So I started trying to find somebody who would bleach my hair that night. This would not happen until he and the CC Riders hit Muncie, Indiana. They were playing the Woodbury Supper Club and struggling through the gigs. The owner told them if things didn't improve by the end of the week, they were out the door. It was at this point in time, Wayne located a local hairdresser willing to experiment on his dome, a man named Joe Gibbons. He dyed and re-dyed Cochran's black hair until it was a pinkish strawberry color. It was clear at this point that his new hair was an unofficial member of the band. Every show, it took an hour to prepare, and on top of that, there was an elaborate schedule of setting, dyeing, conditioning, and bleaching. For some, it's the only thing they saw, in awe, in shock, and disbelief. Like a depraved Charlie Rich, said one reviewer. Elvis Presley in one of Jean Jacques Gabor's wigs, exclaimed a Vegas paper. Many found it ridiculous, but Wayne didn't flinch. I want to make extra friends out of the people who start off by saying I'm disgusting, he said in 1970. And when asked about what he thought about people focusing on his hair, he said, well, they did that all the time. But I realized the hair was like a walking billboard. So if it wasn't for the hair, they would have never heard the music anyhow. In the mid-1960s, 
Cochran and the Riders moved to Florida and became the house band at the barn on Miami's 79th Street Causeway. For the next several years, the most successful of his career, we were there eight or nine months a year. That was our base, our home. Cochran and the Riders held it down six nights a week, three shows a night, and the barn's four drink minimum threw them about $300 to $400 to each musician. While at the barn, he met the actress Anne Margaret and her husband, which led to the band's appearance in a 1970B movie starring her and the former football star Joe Namath, entitled Cece and Company. Namath's character was named Cece Ryder. This in turn led them to Las Vegas, and the band alternated long gigs between the Flamingo and the International. A 1983 Herald story said that he commanded $14,000 a week for his role praised blues act. In Vegas, appropriately enough, Cochran took his style to more garish extremes. He had a southern plantation style suit made by an LA tailor with three quarter length coats cut away in the front over vests and lace shirts with a Napoleonic collar, beautiful embroidery and rhinestones on a very exquisite material. Cochran maintains that when he shared a bill with Elvis Presley, he had a similar suit made just for the king, and after that, he switched entirely to jumpsuits. And Elvis did as well. As you know, what would Elvis be without stealing everything from other artists? By the early 1970s, Cochran had been divorced from his first wife and broken up with his second, Monica. His wild stage behavior became less entertaining and increasingly destructive, smashing chandeliers, dishes, and stage lights. Even he couldn't summon the energy to work six or seven nights a week anymore or for the grinding road, all the one-nighters with their constant setting up and tearing down. It's a rough life, he says. I wouldn't wish it on nobody. He took speed or cocaine to perform, and then you'd have to take a downer to go to sleep afterwards. My downer was always Southern comfort. He began looking for solace. He never felt much for traditional Christianity, and so Cochran began reading up on Eastern religions, pyramid power, and even positive thinking as espoused by Norman Vincent Peale. On the long bus rides, he'd always find something in them that would excite him intellectually, but not spiritually. They would still leave me empty. It didn't touch my heart. He noticed, though, that many of those other sources invoked Holy Scripture to validate their own points of view. In one of his endless series of hotel rooms, he picked up a Gideon Bible, and in 1979, after a gig in Toronto, he called it quits and came off the road, rejoining his second wife, Monica, with whom he'd reconciled. He dropped the band members off one by one, heading south, and by Florida, he was the only one left. Then Cochran started a Bible study group in his living room, which, in 1981, became the Voice for Jesus Church the Wayne Cochran Ministries. Religion was not a word Cochran was fond of. As far as he was concerned, it described another trap of the devil. The word religious, believe it or not, means to be bound again. Religion is bondage. It's all do's and don'ts. We got out of the bondage of sin. To go right back into bondage? Religion is an organized belief system. I'm not bound to it. I don't have religion. I have a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And he realized just how tricky a thing faith was. Faith goes against all intellect, all reasoning, all knowledge. You're trying to believe in something that you can't see. And anytime you hear somebody use reasoning to lower the expectation of the word, that's the flesh. That's the world. That's not God. You really think that you're going to figure out the sense and logic in God's word? Ain't no way. What we have to do is shut up and believe. What do you have for proof? Faith. That's all I need. Because I believe it, it is. As for the relationship with death and the afterlife, Wayne looked at it this way. I don't know about you, but I'm enjoying being here pretty good. I'm not in a hurry to go. He told his congregation during a September 2018 sermon. When God says, wrap it up, I'll say, Okay. And it wouldn't take long for God to yell cut as Wayne Cochran passed away from cancer on November 21st, 2018 at the age of 78 at his Miramar, Florida home. But let's reel it back a bit. Back a few decades to the 1950s. There in the road, straight ahead, a car was stalled, the engine was dead. One of my favorite teenage tragedy songs was inspired not by one accident in particular, but by a string of them on a stretch of highway near Wayne Cochran's hometown, notorious for his fatalities. It was horrible. So I said, I'm going to write a song about a car wreck. So he wrote a song that he described as a 50s song in the 60s. When it comes to the story in the song, the narrator borrows his father's car to take his girlfriend out on a date, and they come upon a stalled car in the road. Unable to stop, the narrator swerves to the right to avoid it, losing control and crashing violently in the process, and knocking him and his girlfriend unconscious. The narrator, later regaining consciousness in the midst of a rainstorm, finds several people at the scene of the accident, and while partially blinded by the blood flowing from his injuries mixing with the rain, the narrator is able to find his girlfriend, still lying unconscious. When he cradles his girlfriend lovingly in his arms, she regains partial consciousness, smiling and asking the narrator to hold her for just a little while. The narrator then gives her the titular last kiss as she fades into death and enters the afterlife. In the song's chorus, the narrator vows to be a good person so that he may reunite with his love when his time comes. 
believing that she had made it into heaven. The song was not a huge hit, at least for Wayne. His manager Bobby Smith had been hired by King Records and he got them to sign Cochran and re-release Last Kiss as his second single. King was R&B though, said Wayne, so I realized it wasn't going to sell on that label. They put it out and nothing. But then after it had been out four or five weeks, there was this guy from Odessa, Texas who was recording an album. He would listen to the radio on the way back to the studio and that was the only city in America where Last Kiss played. It was number one and this guy, J. Frank Wilson, loved that song. So he went into the studio and recorded it note for note. It shot up right to the top of the charts. This led to a heated showdown with the no-nonsense boss of King Records, the chain-smoking Sid Nathan. I went into Sid Nathan's office and I said, Sid, why didn't my song sell? And he said it because it was no damn good. And I laid the billboard chart on his desk and I said, and how is it number two in the nation this week? He didn't say a word. So I got my vengeance. J. Frank Wilson and the Cavaliers had their first and only commercial success with Last Kiss. Well, where, oh, where can my baby be? Their cover reached the top 10, staying for 8 weeks. It eventually reached number 2 on the Billboard Hot 100 charts, and also earned the band a gold record. Their version being a hit prompted Wayne to re-record a version, and when that version picked up, the Cavaliers recorded another version. Extremely petty on both sides, and I am honestly here for it. Suddenly Roush, producer for J. Frank Wilson and the Cavaliers, took a reconstructed version of the band on a brutal promotional tour in support of the record. On a concert trip to Ohio, the band had just left Parksburg, West Virginia, heading to Lima, Ohio, for a performance at the Candy Can Club. At about 5.15 a.m., Roush apparently fell asleep at the wheel, and their car drifted across the center line and rammed head-on into a trailer truck. Roush was killed instantly. Everyone else suffered injuries, but J. Frank Wilson Wilson's were the worst. The Last Kiss album cover shows Wilson kneeling over the young woman portraying the dying girl. And supposedly the first prints of the cover showed blood trickling down the girl's face, but it was airbrushed out by the record company for fear of alienating parents, which would limit sales of the album. Wilson with or without the Cavaliers, continued to record until 1978. He passed away on October 4th, 1991, due to alcoholism caused by business stresses and pain caused from the injuries in his car wreck. He was only 49 years old. But Last Kiss would hit the charts again in 1973 by way of the Canadian band called Wednesday. Their version went to number one there and earned several Juno nominations and an RPM award for outstanding sales in Canada. It would chart once again in the 90s when Pearl Jam resurrected the oldie and reintroduced it to a brand new crowd of people that may have never heard it before otherwise. She's gone. Lead singer Eddie Vedder came across the song when he found the record in an antique store in Seattle before a show. He bought it and stayed up all night listening to it. And he took it to the band and they played it throughout the summer of their 1998 tour. They recorded it at a sound check and released it as a single to their fan club who often got songs that are unavailable to the public. But after a while, radio stations got copies and started playing it. By the spring of 1999, they decided to put it out as a single on the condition that the proceeds went to benefit refugees in Kosovo. Now, when you think of Pearl Jam, you might think of this song. It may not be your first thought when thinking of them, but I guess it should be because Last Kiss was their highest charting single. It peaked at number two, losing out to by Jennifer Lopez. That one move by Eddie Vedder made Wayne a pile of dough. The song has a long tradition in Latin American popular music as well. The most popular version was recorded in 1965 by Mexican singer Polo. And the Colombian singer Alcia Acosta. Mexican singer Gloria Trevi released her version of the song in 1989. In 2011, Trent Dabbs recorded a version of Last Kiss for the hit television series The Vampire Diaries for season 2 episode 18, The Last Dance. Last Kiss by Wayne Cochran comes in at 147 beats per minute, while J. Frank Wilson's version is 135, and Pearl Jam's comes in at 112. Last Kiss is a bizarre little song. If you have anxiety, you may jump to thoughts like what would happen if you were in a situation like this. Losing a loved one is never easy, never, and true love never ends. Last Kiss encapsulates that perfectly. This week's Love Homework is a song that was released exactly 20 years after Last Kiss and is a more modern take on the song, 7-Eleven by the Ramones. Oncoming car ran out of control. It 
crush my baby and it crush my soul. Another episode in a row with a biopic. So for the biopic of Wayne Cochran, and this took a lot of narrowing down, and there were a lot of contenders, I eventually landed on Chris Bauer. If you like what you learned, and you'd like to continue learning, please drop a like below, and absolutely subscribe if you haven't. Believe it or not, I have the rest of the year and all of 2022 planned out, so we are just getting started. Subscribe, hit the bell, and look forward to Fridays when I drop a new episode. Until next time, my name is Richard Hunt, and you heard it in a love song. I looked at it and I thought about where God has brought me since this. And it's overwhelming. And all the time, almost, almost every step, I worried. I would get over it and I'd pray my way out of it, but I worried. I don't know how many times in my life I thought it was the end of the road. I was doomed. There's no way out. If I was in faith, faith at that moment, I would just say, you know, it's going, to be, it's going to be funny to see how he does this. But if I wasn't in faith, I'd be shivering in fear.